So Tanishka, welcome to Wolf Brothers podcast. You're the first guest on the new edition of this podcast. So I'm very privileged to have you on. And I wanted you to be the first guest because this podcast is about men's rites of passage and men's journey through life and how we can I suppose understand ourselves better to make that journey and I think from what I've learned from you over the past well it's only probably been about six months since I discovered you maybe a bit longer but it was a bit longer than that but I I've learned so much from your books and your courses and from meeting you in person as well that I feel that I needed to have you on to share some of this wisdom with the men of Ireland because personally I feel I didn't have much maps growing up as to you know how to be a man or how to journey into manhood and you know become the person or the man I wanted to be so just through your books and courses I've started to discover some of these maps and I wanted to you know delve deep into them today and yeah see what we can share with men who may be you know looking for some of this wisdom and ready to receive it so um that's my thank you my long intro yeah, what I, bless you. yeah thanks so, so much it yeah. makes my heart sing even to just hear you speak those words acknowledging that you didn't have those maps mm -hmm. and that you know unless we acknowledge that there's an issue we can't even begin the work of healing it or addressing it you know and so you know so many men are wandering around disempowered and they don't realize just how disempowered because there's no benchmark. There's no, mm -hmm. you know, and then a, a sort of, well, what I observe is many men are escaping into fantasizing about being the hero or the man they wish they could be by, you know, whether it's virtual games or, you know, videos or, you know, there's just men are hurting, mm -hmm. you know, and as a woman, I was actually saying this to a girlfriend earlier today that so many men are confounded by a woman who knows who she is, has taken that road less travelled to understand herself. And, you know, a woman's deepest yearning is to be fully claimed by a man. You know, we want the men to initiate yeah, whether that's asking us out or, you know, we want that. But men are lacking the confidence, I've noticed, in the West, and it's because they don't know who they are. And that was a deliberate ploy. It's not their fault because the first thing that the empires do, which they did to all of our ancestors, no matter where we hail from, was they forbade people to practice their Indigenous customs. Mm -hmm. And for the Western world, that was the grail, the ancient mystic tradition that was central to life. Mm -hmm. And so you take away people's intrinsic cultural identity that's been handed down millennia, generation to generation, and within a generation people forget and they don't know who they are. And when you don't know who you are, you are easily manipulated, controlled and dominated. Yeah, it's a mechanic of war. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so those of us that had ancestors that were colonised, it, it, it's on our shoulders now to take up that quest to truly know what was lost and reclaim it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And um, yeah, I was really, I was nearly feeling emotional there when you were speaking because I think, mm -hmm. you know, as Irish people, sometimes you don't, realize how much of our power was taken as men when we were colonized and and when you're speaking there it's kind of stirring some of that up in me of like of course you know our power was taken and i'm really feeling that recently um and you mentioned the grail tradition and i suppose just for people who haven't heard of it before um could you speak into you know what that was and that tradition that used to be in this in this area 
Yeah, happily. Thank you for giving me a forum. So the first rite of passage in a man's life absolutely should be secret or sacred. The word used to be interchangeable. Men's business. Yeah, men inviting boys over that threshold into their manhood. And it is, you know, a time of cutting those apron strings from the mother and boys would traditionally go out and face their fear of the unknown, the darkness, by spending a night alone, tending a fire, you know, sitting with just the witnesses of the ancestors, the stars, you know, and then they'd be welcomed back in the morning, you know. Now, after that, here is the thing, and I know you know this, that men were then initiated by priestess women through their consecutive rites of passage that happened annually during midwinter, the most feminine time on the cycle, when a man who has not integrated a healthy feminine in his own psyche is at serious risk of such negative self-talk, yeah, that he could end up feeling suicidal, he's so depressed. Or if he's not in touch with his emotions, he will sabotage himself through illness or injury rather than express his darker emotions, which is what the dark months take us down to do to face the shadow. And women, the reason women did this or presided over these rites was that we get taken down 13 times a year with our menses, yeah? At Well, before the advent of electricity, every woman bled with the dark phase of the moon, new moon. So we would have our, our dark retreat once a month. Men have it once a year because men are ruled by the sun, women by the moon in terms of the cyclic biorhythm that we have when we choose to incarnate it into either a female or a male form, which in this time of gender confusion, it's worth noting the soul is gender fluid in all of us. doesn't matter what our anatomy is. We have both active and receptive energy. We have feminine and masculine traits, feminine and masculine archetypes psychologically. So for us to be balanced and whole, yes, we need to empower all of them. But the gender we've chosen to incarnate into, that's the one our soul said this is the one that needs the most healing. And you're going to be in that body, even if it's uncomfortable, to make you deal with it, you know? Mm -hmm. So I know that is potentially very controversial to say in this time of cancel culture where people are, you know, deplatformed and censored for speaking things that are not in alignment with the protocols of Agenda 30, which is being rolled out by the globalists. Um, but, you know, as well as that annual rite of passage, men received support through their four life stages. Mm -hmm. So, again, this was presided by women whose gift to the greater community is that we are soul midwives yeah because just as the men are great at you know if I need directions I would prefer to ask a man yeah because the the masculine governs the outer world what we can see but I'm a better guide to the inner realms yeah so I might get lost and need to ask a man for directions if I'm trying to get somewhere but likewise, I know my skill is helping men to navigate the terrain within, the darkness, the unseen realm, which is the realm of the feminine in all of us, the soul. Mm. Yeah, that's um, yeah, definitely something that I'm starting to, you know, understand now more. And I was chatting with one of my brothers there recently just about you know, having that balance of the feminine energies and the masculine energies within us. And um, I suppose for myself on my own journey, it was, you know, it was, I was such a, on the outside, like this strong masculine type of man who played football and stuff like that. But on the inside, the feminine was very weak 
like this is going back a good few years and then I had to start delving into that because um I suppose maybe it's something you can touch on is like what I think it's the meeting with the um the meeting with the feminine you know in the external world that kind of first love that often pushes men down into the you know the search for their own inner feminine so maybe if you want to speak about that and how you know if we don't get in touch with that inner feminine as men what are the consequences yeah you know i saw a sign i was on the back of a motorbike here in bali the other day and uh it was a sign that said hero but they did something to the the, the zero you know the o mm -hmm. and you could see the word her and i went oh my god there is no hero without her yeah the mystic initiation is what enables the hero to rise in a man. And that's why women were burned for 5,000, oh, 5,000, 500 years. Yeah. The enemy of the state. Yeah. Because they couldn't have the men getting up off their knees and facing their fears with courage. And that's, you know, the catalyst of what happens when a man receives mystic initiation. But what you spoke to, when you said, you know, hey, I did football and I was a man's man, you know, and my feminine was underdeveloped because how could it have been developed, you know, when you didn't receive that? This speaks to the archetype of Apollo and he governs the solar plexus, which is the lower mental body. And he has a bit of an identity crisis, to be honest. He's the sort of guy, he's a great all-rounder, and some men have a stronger Apollo archetype expression than others, but he is the one which is rewarded in patriarchy. Okay, so he's good scholastically, you know, academically, and he's good on the sports field, right? So he's getting a lot of positive validation. And so that leads him to people, please. Okay, so the more I achieve, the more I get a good response. So it actually becomes a compulsion, an addiction. And the more he tries to get, you know, that good recognition externally, whether it's from his parents or teachers or peers or, you know, the less he's connected with himself. Yeah. So it can be harder for successful men to really take that journey within to know themselves because in a patriarchal culture when we ask the big questions and we go what the fuck am I doing here yeah really who am I what is this life about you know and if those big questions can't be answered at winter solstice that's when men are at risk of you know topping themselves mm -hmm. so having somebody who can guide them through those questions in a way where they're not going to spiral into self-loathing and self-negating and beat up on themselves and do something rash and reckless. That's the role of the mystic feminine in supporting men. And, you know, patriarchy kind of casts this distortion that you're not a hero unless you do it all on your own which is why men don't ask for directions. No, I can figure this out myself. You know, they think if I don't do it all on my own, I can't claim the victory as mine. And men only do that when their self-worth is pinned on what they do, not on who they are. So that's classic, you know, shadow Apollo. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> I don't know if I answered the question. Yeah. If, I, if I haven't fully answered it, please no, call I think me up. Yeah, that's, I think that's a brilliant direction to go because, yeah, I still struggle with that, you know, try, not trying to do it all on my own. Mm. It's just so ingrained into me that I'm like, but as you said, when I notice when I'm not thinking about my own achievements, I'm thinking about the greater mission. I don't mm. mind asking for help. I don't mind asking like, because it's not about me anymore. It's about the mission. Mm. So that definitely resonates and yeah, what's coming what to me What a now? beautiful point you raised there. Yeah. Yeah. Can I speak to that yeah, for a yeah. moment? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So my big demon was stage fright and I was given 
because you know it's pretty much up there with the number one fear public speaking for people for me it was more singing but when the, the lights are on us, there's the fear of being judged as not enough, not good enough, not getting it right. That's all solar plexus fear. Yeah. And I was given the best advice in my early 20s by a playwright in Australia called Michael Gurr. And he said, when you stand on a stage, it's not about you. It's about them. Think about what, what takeaway do I want for them? What do I want them to feel? What do I want them to think? right? So whether you're going for a job interview, you know, whether you're getting up and doing stand up on tonight's show, it doesn't matter. But when the stakes are high, make it about service, you know, like JF Kennedy said, how can I serve my country? You know, the more you take it off yourself, the less pressure there is. Whereas when the critical mind feels that their worth is based on how others perceive them. The stakes are always high. Yeah, so there's no resilience. Yeah, it's like the base level for the nervous system is elevated because there's always the fear of rejection. And so we can't succeed without failure. You ask any person that's truly successful and Fuck, they've had some spectacular failures. Yeah. And so the only failure is not trying. Mm -hmm. We have to give ourselves permission to make huge mistakes, particularly in our 20s. That's what our 20s are for. Yeah. So in the Australian Indigenous culture, they do a one eye ceremony when you turn 30. And the whole point of that is, all the cock-ups that you did up until you sat in return, yeah, at, in your 29th year, they're just chalked up to experience. You're not going to be condemned for them the rest of your life. Yeah. Yeah, I can definitely um, say I've made many fuck-ups in my 20s. So um, it's Haven't good we all? they have not counted. Um, yeah, can, can you, we're kind of touching on the different archetypes on different chakras there. So mm. I think this, this is in your sacred union book that I'm still working through very slowly because I just want to like absorb it. And uh, I just love the way you've linked the archetypes with the different chakras and then also the stages of development. Um, so maybe we could talk through some of them just as I was saying at the start, I think as men, we just love these maps because then we can, yeah journey so like starting off with the the root chakra which i feel this one is really you know missing from you know yeah I, or like men in general probably in the west but like for me that that wild man tapping into the pan archetype so maybe you can just talk about that yeah now. yeah i'm having a hot flush just thinking about pan got to yeah. remove a veil <laughs> 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 Um, okay. Yeah. Look, I I'm going to speak to the fact that from my observance, having spent a fair bit of time recently in, in the UK, um, you've lost your wilderness mm -hmm. and with that, you've lost your wild man archetype. Whereas in Australia, the wild archetypes of Pan, the wild man and Lilith, the wild woman are more accessible to people. Yeah. I mean, Australians, we're uncouth, we're coarse, our sense of humour, you know. But in that, we we don't carry our as much shame about whether it's our bodily functions or, you know, sex or, 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 or anger, you know, or periods, you know. So this is all, sorry, I'm burning up. Um <laughs> This is all, uh, you know, 2,000 years of us being programmed to associate the wild with the demonic, with evil, with, you know, oh, that's not acceptable. You will be rejected if you dare let your natural self out in public. Like even the fact that it is punishable by being put in jail if you're naked in public. Mm. Yeah, 
It's like, what does that say about us as a culture that, you know, who we are, our most authentic self is considered such a threat to society, you know, that you can be instantly, it's so shocking, locked away. Whereas, you know, you go to cultures that are still living close to the earth and they don't have the hang-ups about nudity and 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 when we hide the natural self, then we get distortions. You know, this is why we have the Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde thing going on where, you know, we see so many guys addicted to porn and they're, they're torn up about it because, you know, the way it works is it's programming men to seek more and more of the taboo to get the rush of titillation and excitement. And that taboo takes them into darker and darker realms of whether it's degrading another being or dominating in a way that's perhaps more edgy, more violent, more you know. And so it's not surprising that we see, and I'm forming a fist, we're seeing impotence in much younger men, you know, and and this is a, a flag that men's virility, their sense of male power is so lacking that they're desperate to get a hit of feeling powerful, yeah, through something which is completely artificial, you know, because men who are truly empowered are not susceptible to a porn addiction, yeah? So rather than focus on the symptom, yeah, and, and the reason it creates impotency is that if you are ejaculating and, you know, that's your life force, yeah, um, and you're not in an experience where the energy is spiraling up through your energy centers, yeah? So you're not feeling um, the sense of expansion of consciousness. You know, there's a reason we all yell, oh, God, when we climax. You know, even atheists, even agnostics, you know, it's because the ego is dissolving into the one unified field, call it what you want, you know. <clears throat> and without the sacredness, without acknowledging it is the most sacred act on the planet, yeah, to have that level of intimacy and disillusion of the ego, of worrying about what you think. I mean, when you have great sex, you're so beyond what you look like. I mean, I look like I've got cerebral palsy if I'm having a really good time in bed, right? No offence to our people <laughs> dealing with disability. But, right. Yeah. So this whole thing of associating sexy with how we look, we are so missing the point, you know. That's more like a lion looking at a steak. It's more predatory. It's like, yeah, I'm hungry. I want to devour that. That's energy. Yeah, it's vampiric. Whereas... You know, I've gone right into sex here. There's more to pan than just sex. But, you know, if a man is afraid of um, the elements, afraid of not surviving, and this is why men love watching Man vs. Wild and, you know, all these kind of survivor or Steve Irwin when he was alive, it's like the fantasy of not being afraid of nature, which is the feminine principle, chaos, the unknown, mm. yeah? So how do we get over that? You go walk about. You go and actually face your fear front on. You go and spend some time in nature, yeah? You learn how to camp. You learn how to do a bit of foraging, hunter-gatherer, you, you know? Um, you, you, men are being 
we are being shamed more and more for the primal self. And this is all part of the conditioning of, you know, there's not going to be enough food to go around. You've all got to be vegan, you know. Um, and so the hunter is being shamed, yeah? yeah. The, the sense of communion you have when you eat a fish that you caught, that's that's more sacred than going into a church and eating some processed wafer that do you know what I mean it's like everything has been distorted so we've lost our sense of communion with the earth you know I've heard of rituals where men used to literally <laughs> dig a hole and put their penis into the earth you know what I mean and like wed the earth you know and that union with the earth when a man has come home to that when he really feels at home in his body on the earth plane mm. he's not going to feel shame about being white yeah that shame is something that we've been fed Again, as a disempowerment, oh, you're to blame. No, you're not. The empires have systematically disempowered everyone, regardless of the colour of our skin. I got on a bit of a diatribe there. Again, I don't know if I answered the question. <laughs> oh, you, you did. Man. This is brilliant. I'm loving this. There's so much to go into. It's like I'm trying to like guide myself as well back to it. But I think what you just touched on there at the end was so important with, with the shame because i was at a a men's gathering there just before christmas and there was men from different countries and i remember one of the english men he actually he wanted to like nearly apologize on behalf of the english people for what they did to the irish and i was just like and only now he obviously knew he couldn't do that but he just wanted to mm -hmm. say it anyway um and i it really struck a chord within me because I was holding so much judgment against him for being English. And then he was holding so much shame for what his people did. But as you said, it wasn't him, like he wasn't involved in that. It was the empire and he was carrying that shame. I was carrying that anger. And I think I even spoke to, I did speak to you about this and like how we need to heal that divide or that anger that we have and against say the the english and the, the shame that they feel and it, it might not be like in your conscious awareness but it's deep down i feel that we still have that um but then going back to the shame around our sexuality yeah for me as well that's something i did a lot of work on last year actually um with a fellow Niall graham who will be on the podcast next but uh really just delved into all of that shame and that those disowned aspects and the judgment that I had around even just yeah my penis like just completely judging it as this yeah. like, evil thing that just wanted to you mm. know have pleasure and didn't actually care about women and like this is all, my heart's judgment of you know my penis and I'm sharing that not because I want it but I feel it's because other so many men in Ireland are experiencing similar things and you know, as men, just from being with groups of men from the football pitch to the pub to wherever we, we might talk about women a lot, but we'll rarely actually speak about the act of sex when we go into the details of it, because we're too shamed to actually speak about, you know, tips or techniques or anything like, and no one teaches us any real, yeah. you know, how do you actually please a woman? And I think, right to let go of some of that shame <clears throat> we obviously need to you know go in and accept those parts of ourselves but also we need to learn how do we actually you know please a woman mm. how do we perform the act of sex or making love and i know this is part of what would have been included in you know men's rites of passage or men you know as they move into the before they engage in sacred union. So maybe you can, I know we're going off the, the archetypes. It's meandering and it's, it's, it's organic. Well, yeah, yeah. So maybe you can talk about that. What, you know, was, 
how men were prepared for you know meeting yeah. and, and uh, yeah yeah so yeah, I mean even before we get to the bedchamber and ironically there's one behind me yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's funny we're talking yeah. about all this today um just courtship you know again this thing of men are expected to have the courage to risk rejection to ask a woman out but there's no mentoring on how to successfully court a woman um and i just want to say to the men that are listening that the most wonderful thing you can do is a risk looking like a fool for love yeah that will melt a woman so it might be that you you know have a bunch of flowers or you make a goofy sign it's it's not about money yeah that women want to have their heart moved and that means you risking bearing your heart that's how you immediately de-armor a woman yeah secondly the more time that you spend having with yourself like quality time um expressing your creativity perhaps writing poetry or playing making up songs on the guitar or you know um learning to cook and and exploring with different recipes and tastes these are the things that you will then have to share with a woman or for the gay brothers you know another man but a courtship is about sharing the jewels and the gifts that you found in your own soul exploration. Yeah, if you don't know yourself, how can someone else get to know you? You haven't spent the time finding the riches within to be able to bring them out and say, oh, these are my paintings or let me write a, uh, read you a poem. Yeah, so the love arts is what's been lost, you know. I, I remember uh, an ex-partner of mine had a 15-year-old son and he could not boil an egg. And I said to him, look, you wanna, you're going to want to start impressing women, I'm betting. You need to know how to make a really good breakfast the morning after. And then he was interested in cooking. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So when it comes to sex, though, you know, it was that men would be instructed by a priestess and the priestesses then in when the empires first came upon us were reduced to courtesans who weren't just you know the prostitutes working on the street or in lowly brothels these were the women that had the ear of empires and uh, generals and were across the political landscape and so it used to be that men of you know rank would seek out a woman who had been schooled in the mysteries at a mystery school so a woman who could guide him with wisdom with intuition with dreams with visions so that he made good choices if he had a sphere of influence. Yeah, he knew he needed that in a queen. So too, you know, men would bow their egos from the age of 21, which is when, you know, you were initiated into the grail rites, which was the wisdom of the mystic feminine. Um, and so, you know, women would instruct men on the art of pleasure, you know, the art of lovemaking. These are arts, just like the healing art. Now, we look at a patriarchal culture, art doesn't get the funding sport does, mm. right? And art is the language of the soul. So, you know, if, if you're to be a wonderful lover, 
you need to actually develop the soul. For instance, the more we open our empathic heart, which is attuning to somebody without words and sensing what they're feeling, then you can, with your eyes closed, intuit where your lover is directing you to touch them. Yeah, rather than, you know, you've got to have your eyes open all the time. You've got to say bit to the left, bit to the right. No, that is staying in the rational. And so long as you're in the rational, you're not available to your sensate arousal, you know. So, you know, great sex is about the union of light bodies that happens on the inner planes. And this is why women are attracted to musicians because it's like, ah, you know, he's able to express his soul. That's what we go weak at the knees for. That's the final scene of the rom-com when he finally goes, I can't lose her. I'm going to have to risk looking like a fool for love and tell her how I feel. That's, we watch all these corny fucking scripts and just like, oh, this is woeful, just to get that payoff at the end, that hope that maybe one day a man will risk losing face socially in order to win our heart. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, that's says it all really. I think you summed it up quite well there, just um, why we have to do the inner work to get in touch with our soul parts so we can make that union. And I think, yeah, it's definitely hard for, for men and women at the moment to like, I think fully connect in because we just don't know, you know, how to do that. So I'm constantly discover more about myself and my own, um, you know, sexual needs and desires and then how that, mm. you know, wines with my partner and stuff like that so yeah it's there's so much to it as well when you actually look into it like the from tantra to the Taoist stuff and it's yeah there's a whole art and uh like continuous learning there so um i think the shame is just so big that we don't even look there so i think yeah if you're starting at the root chakra with the pan archetype it seems like getting in touch with your sexual nature and getting in touch with mother earth, you know, and connect mm. like that's, would that be like, in your opinion, like a great yes. place to start? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So what I would prescribe. Yeah. Okay. Is that you gift yourself time once a month to go walk about Spend time in nature, even if it's two hours. So if you've got a young family, you may not be able to get away for a whole day, for instance. But I'm not talking a local park with, you know, topiary trees and <laughs> manicured hedges. You know, find a bit of wild, yeah, and just go and spend time in nature. You might want to take a, a book that not to read but to draw or write your thoughts or you you might like to capture the beauty of nature on your phone by taking some photos you know but just communing with nature and this will revive your energy you know it's said if you have sore eyes look upon natural beauty you know just being in the negative ions of nature or you know and if you sweat a bit, it's like, yeah, enjoy the funkiness of your own smell. And maybe if you can find a space where you know you're not going to be disturbed, make love to yourself. Yeah. Let Pan out. Yeah. Because he deserves to be a part of your psyche. You know, he is the satyr. He's half goat. He's half man. So he is... He's the animal part of our psyche. And when he's locked and put in a cage, then that's when, you know, we can have fantasies that are dark, you know, or um, he'll come out in inappropriate ways. So 
we really need to welcome him back in ways that are appropriate, you know? Yeah. yeah definitely. And I've been speaking about this recently to people and I feel a lot of men, we've been misled in terms of spiritual practice. Like we've started looking to the East to, you know, Hinduism or Buddhism and we're looking at meditation and we're looking at now great practices and I've got lots from them, but it seemed to me, even when I was in India recently, just an example of the disconnection that I feel from that pan energy was when we were up on a mountain in Tiruvannamali where, you know, loads of people come to reach enlightenment and we were up in the temple there and we were in the cave and meditating and I had a really cool experience in the cave, but it was on the way down, we were coming back to the city and there was a, a forest and I just looked around and the forest was just destroyed in like rubbish and litter. Now, obviously I know the the litter system in India probably, you know, isn't the best because there's lots of poverty in the country and I know all that, but I think as a symbol, it really showed how these Eastern, yeah. you know, spiritualities, which obviously have been turned into religions. I'm sure the core, you know, Sufism or mm -hmm. um, whatever would have been more, you know, true, but they have completely neglected the earth, you know, as sacred. And um, I think yeah. coming back to the, to the earth, to the feminine principle and worship in the feminine is what we need to come back to, to balance. I know you speak yes. about the, if you want to speak to like how patriarchy has kind of distorted what we originally would have had in balance, even with the cross, you know, moving up from that yeah. balanced cross, if you want to speak to that, maybe. Yeah, thanks. Um, thank you for even raising this because, yeah, patriarchy swept over the whole globe. Nothing was untouched. So, you know, if we think about the Hindu faith, it's, Krishna, um, Vishnu, and um, Shiva, the triple god, is worshipped. And, yes, Kali has temples, you know, the, the, the primal feminine, but she's not given the same uh, elevation, if you will, you know. And, you know, the same with Buddhism as well. There's a sense of the ideal is to be an ascetic, someone who is celibate, someone who doesn't spill their seed, somebody who is beyond sex. Now, there's two paths. There's the white path, which is the path of purification through yoga, meditation and fasting. And this, like the upward triangle, oh, funny, um, is about seeking union with the divine father, with pure consciousness. Now, all the religions of the world are based on that. The And so, you know, they're all patriarchal, right? The opposite path is not evil. It's not demonic. It's the red path. So like the downward triangle, which in the Hindu faith represents the goddess, it's the descent path. So rather than ascending, we are going deep into the roots of the cosmic tree of life to know just how dark our shadow is. In other words, if we don't see and take responsibility for our own dark side, we will project it externally to disassociate from it. And that's the root of fascism. Yeah, it's like... If we're seeking, you know, the favor of a projection we've put onto the Sky Father that we must be pure, we must be perfect, i.e. spiritual ambition, which is the ego, yeah, it's the mind hijacking the soul, then we need a scapegoat. So whether that's the lowest caste in India or the African-Americans or the gays or you know, the Jews, whatever, right? 
that is not balanced. So, you know, and we think about the Illuminati and, you know, it's just hierarchy does not work for us. So we've got to balance ourselves since the microcosm and macrocosm reflect each other. So rather than feel overwhelmed about the state of the world, it's like, well, heal yourself and you will ripple out in this holographic world that we're in and affect great change. So the red path is the path of initiation into the mystic feminine. So this is shamanism, this is tantra, this is sacred blood mysteries, which, whoa, that might sound a bit evil, but blood is the life force. And so, you know, this was a central part of the sacrament of the ancient mystic tradition. And it's only that we've become so squeamish about blood that we associate it with violence and death and evil acts, the taking of life rather than with life, as it used to be honoured as the most life-giving magical substance on the world, in the world that can literally turn grey hair black again. It can heal cuts. I mean, no wonder they used to worship it and mark their graves up with it, you know, charge up their healing amulets with it. You know, it is so to demonize the most sacred blood, the blood of the womb. Yeah, I mean, we have stem cell research and all this today. It's one and the same substance. And yet the idea of a woman menstruating, it's like Voldemort. You can't say that in public, you know. <laughs> you know, so what we've had is the great deceiver, that which was most sacred has been inverted and portrayed as the most evil. Mm. And so we need our brothers to stand with us, our husbands, our fathers, our lovers, to actually say, all right, we need to bow our ego. We need to listen to the wisdom of the mystic feminine, of the women that have done those deep descents every month, have gone to the Moon Lodge, have humbled their ego to turn their most bitter, painful experiences into understanding. And, you know, we're seeing, I mean, that is happening. People are, are tuning in and listening on YouTube to astrologer women and, you know, but still there is a mindset, like I know I was living in um, Morocco from January through April this year and I picked up a pamphlet when I was in Turkey last year in one of the mosques, you know, what is Islam? I'm like, oh, yeah, let's get the, the thumbnail on that. And it spoke about the five prophets and they were all men. Mm. And it's like, well, just hang on a minute, you know, <laughs> Before the rise of the empires and patriarchy, there were prophetesses. People would queue up in the hot sun at the Oracle at Delphi, you know, for hours and hours to receive guidance from a mystic woman. You know, all the kings, as I said before, would consult the wisdom of a woman who had opened her inner vision, her inner hearing, her inner sensing, her inner knowing, because he valued what she had to say. Whereas these days, the mystic feminine in every portrayal in the media is seen as kooky, flaky, evil, or the sexy babe who uses magic as an evil power to seduce, you know, and have power over men. And this is all, you know, even if you didn't grow up Catholic, the cult of the Roman Empire, you know, if you're in the thought form, the group mind, it's still impacting you and it's in every insidious part of society that you shouldn't trust the feminine, whether it was, you know, Eve who gave the apple the fruit of knowledge, you know, she was giving him a gift. She was giving him more than a self-help book, you know, or um, Pandora. Oh, I forgot her name. Anyway, you get the gist. <clears throat> Or like Pandora's box, so she opened yes, it. 
Thank you. That was exactly who I was trying to think of. Bless you. Um, yeah, and I think I don't even feel we realize yeah, how conditioned we are just with everything from yeah, the Catholic Church to just everything in society. And I, just from my own understanding, I, it is that fear of the unknown. We don't understand the feminine and the power of the feminine which intimidates men, I feel, you know, because... Right. I think you said in your book as well, like we're scared of the Oni, like we're afraid of that wild, you know, primal power of the feminine energy. And uh, the only thing we can do then as men is to try and control it in the external world because we're usually physically more powerful. So that's what we we go to. But it's it's out of fear yeah, to, to try and control it comes from that fear um, yes. and actually or veiling women. Mm, yeah. Yeah, and and I even just I actually I don't know if I was saying to you I started working with um just a bit of part time work with an organisation so we're working with men who are perpetrators of domestic violence, and we're doing mm -hmm. a program to help them take responsibility for what they've done and help them I suppose with the aim to make it safer for women and children who they're going to be interacting with um and I I'm seeing in the men like originally I called these must be you know, some sort of monsters to be able to, you know, be violent towards women. But you, and I kind of knew that they wouldn't be. But then when you see them, you're like, oh, my God, they're just lost boys that are you can see the child in their eyes that they're just afraid. And usually they had some of their own childhood trauma of abuse in the home and they don't know. And like, often by the mother. Yeah, as well. It's a lot of them, too. And it's this fear of the feminine that when they're triggered by something yeah. in the relationship, some old wound is triggered, they just boil up and the rage comes out. And usually it's unconscious and it's just like, as we were saying there, if you're not connected to that pan energy, the wild man, it just, it bursts out in this unconscious way and then it turns into violence. And um, I'm really, just being in that work, I'm really seeing the intricacies of how that's happening and, um, like there's a lot of men that aren't violent, but they have that same trigger when their, you know, partner says something to them that hurts. It just you feel it down your stomach and it triggers you, and you, the anger comes up to protect you. Um, and I suppose for me, I'm seeing that the anger is for us to tap into our power as protectors yeah. of women, not to protect yeah. ourselves necessarily, but yeah. So um if you can maybe speak to i'm looking at it's funny because yeah. i have a few books here holding up my light and one of them is tales of king arthur so some hmm. of them gave to me so maybe if you can speak about you know the role of the masculine or the role of men in hmm. society in the ancient societies and, Beautiful. yeah 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 so i mean the industrial age sent our men away so that they were absent fathers you know, and were wedded to the system. That was Rome. Yeah, you had to swear your allegiance to the empire over your family, over yourself. And many men continue to do that, working long hours for a corporation who is destroying the earth and is soul-destroying work, you know. So the more men unplug from the system and listen to their heart and go, what would make me happy? You know, maybe the kids need to come out of private school so that I can stop doing a job that's destroying me. And, you know, we both work part time or, you know what I mean? That men's happiness is actually relevant. You know, there's an expectation that men self-sacrifice as wage slaves. So no wonder we see a commitment phobic society of men you know, um, which leaves children fatherless, you know, and then we have that endemic trauma handed down because kids need both the masculine and the feminine input into their upbringing to be balanced, to develop both, you know. Yeah. Um, I've forgotten what the question was and yeah. I was so excited what we were talking about before, but yeah. my, my thought role. bubble just burst like soap. Yeah, so I suppose it's the role of men in, in 
society and yeah. like yeah we're so lost in terms of our role and we feel you know even yeah. with the, a lot of stuff going on in the media i feel like it's maybe coming to a head now but it's you know this white men are the problem sort of thing and we're like what the hell do we do now we're just like um we can't say anything we don't know what our role is men yeah. are suicide rates and men are like usually twice that of women yeah. and so, men are being scapegoated now yeah particularly white men yeah you're being held up as the pinup boy of blame mm. yeah it's become socially acceptable to dump on men and yeah. particularly white men as the culprit you know and it's it's a spin so that we don't look at the empire and go hang on we're all in this together the 99 percent you know it's like we've got a common enemy here yes. you know rather than buy into this pitting of one against the other you know mm -hmm. um for me my deepest wish is that our men stand with us in solidarity that they say listen to her i mean what you're doing right now saying brothers listen to her yeah because me on my own saying men listen to me <laughs> when for 2000 years men have been told women are not to be listened to that we shouldn't be trusted that we don't have their best interests in heart at heart yeah that we'll mislead them as the woman is temptress seductress or the evil hag you, you know uh, or will trap them as a as a wife you know so to actually um bow your ego to say no i'm going to be receptive which is a feminine quality and i'm going to listen to what it is you have to say on the understanding the inspiration that women are often and i'm not saying all women okay there is a lot, lot of women that are masculine dominant just because you got a set of boobs and ovaries does not make you feminine and i don't mean wearing florals either I, I, it's more like are you somebody that um values the journey of the soul yeah so you know uh particularly listening to older women the women that have journeyed the cycles which of course tempers our ego, regardless of whether we're male or female, listening to the elders, yeah, rather than, oh, what would she know, mum, you know, she's out of touch, she doesn't even know how to do a Zoom call, you know, like it's it's a willingness to, um, or if, if women say, uh, like, in Iran, when when the women were being punished for not wearing the veil, the men that stood with them just broke my heart open. So it's men that are willing to risk negative consequences to stand with women and to be their advocates. Mm. Yeah, we we because we've been conditioned this gender war has been leveraged. They're trying to keep us apart. And beloveds coming together is how the whole paradigm will shift. Because, you know, there is nothing more powerful than love. We come together in love and that we're no longer manipulated by our fears. Yeah? That's why the escalation of fear was perpetrated upon us in 2020 because that's their last ditch attempt because our consciousness is rising. It's inevitable. We're outgrowing just like kids become teenagers and leave home. We're outgrowing the system, which we've projected parent onto. Yes. So we need our men to stop behaving like boys, like being avoidant, running away if we point out their shadow or, you know, going to the pub instead of going to a self-help workshop and not doing it to please us, doing it because they genuinely want to be the best versions of themselves possible. They want to create a legacy they can be proud of. Mm -hmm. You know, they want to grow. That's choosing life. Whereas 
if you're not choosing the path of healing and personal growth and initiation, then you are unconsciously choosing atrophy, entropy, death, mm -hmm. just through stubborn resistance, passive aggressive refusal, mm -hmm. you know, and that is what's slowly killing men. You know, if we look at the fact that men are dying before women in every continent, their life choices are leading to that. Like I went to my 30th high school reunion and every time I went to the women's toilet, the conversation was the same. My God, haven't the men aged compared to the women because their self-care was not as good, which is a feminine trait. Yeah? So... Look, we're seeing it change in the younger men, but a lot of that is because they're rejecting their masculinity completely. They're not wanting to be associated with the men as the perpetrators of pain on women. But that isn't the answer. The answer is we need our men to heal their masculinity, to be proud of their masculinity, to know what it is to be a man, to stand in their manhood. Then, then they're not going to have a problem with impotency you know, then they're going to be able to initiate and to speak their heart to a woman, mm. you know, because currently men are isolated and this leaves them vulnerable psychologically and emotionally to depression because they're not getting their needs met. They're not fulfilling their heart's deepest desires because they're so afraid of looking like a fool for love, mm. which is what the grail teaches men to master. Yes. And yeah, I'm feeling really inspired just listening to you. And I, I think there's loads of men out there that really want to step into that, you know, version of themselves that move towards that king or, you know, that inner king that they know is there. And because I feel it and I know other men feel it. And I and then I see the men who are afraid and they're the ones who will just during you know back in 2020 they will just bow to whatever rule is put upon them and i'm like mm -hmm. me and my friend teen were talking about this recently it's like how can you just bow to an authority without you know checking in with yourself you know without like questioning it and i think that's just yeah it's it's that projection of the parent onto the government or whatever and it's like do you really think they have your best interests at heart? So it's like we we do need men to just wake up to their own inner authority and be like, what's right here? Like, and that's checking in with the feminine principle, their intuition as well, and just being like, does this feel right to me? And um, yeah, so for me, and like obviously it's brilliant for you know men to do this for their own personal journey of becoming happier in themselves and having that union that they're looking for in partnership. But for me, there's also that bigger mission that I really start, like for a while there, I was kind of floating, I think with my mission, but I feel really inspired now recently because I'm like, we need to protect this land. We need to protect mm -hmm. and like, yeah, protect the, the feminine, which is the land and, you know, the women that are yeah. also from that from the land so it's like we need to stand up in our role as protectors and yeah allow this whatever is being birthed to birth and we have to hold that space and i suppose that's why i'm doing this work um obviously from us you know as i step into moving towards my own king as well i feel obviously more joy in life too but uh that's kind of a nice byproduct but i'm like we want a mission we want to be asked to help you know we want a woman to be like can you you know protect yeah. me? can you hold that space for me or and that just gives that just gives me that sense of like ah at least i know why i'm here now um and mm. I can move towards that and yeah i suppose and just another um kind of path i know with the mankind project i've you know been in circle with them and done the rites of passage there and they have the king warrior magician lover but i really would love you to touch on the kind of life stages that men go through in terms of the knight king mage and 
Oh, sorry, Honestly, no. I'd love to, but I'm looking at the time and I've got another interview starting in three minutes. Oh, do you? So oh. I do. Uh, we'll I'm going to have to, um, yeah. I'll have to do a follow up. And in the meantime, I do journey those four life mm. stages in my book, The Grail. So if anyone feels like that's a cliffhanger ending, they can check out the book. Um, and also the the seven masculine archetypes that govern the chakras. I have an online program mm. for men called Rainbow Warrior. So if men are wanting to sort of follow up with resources, then then those are available. Um, and I'm sure you can provide links in the description. Yeah. yeah, I'll provide links to your books and your courses and stuff. I can highly recommend both. I've learned so much from your books and your 12 sons facilitator course which we didn't get into either but um the 12 sons practice but yeah we'll maybe have to do another follow-up interview at some point because there's so much to cover but yeah thank you very much Tanishka for your time and it's been a, a oh yeah thank you always you know it heals my heart when you well pretty much everything that comes out of your mouth Cormac <laughs> because yeah. it's it's my dearest heart wish, mm. yeah, for the men to uh, be embodying what you're embodying. So you're a, a light, a shining example. So thank you. Mm, thank mm. you.